All right, what I'd like to do is review the activity that we had in class last time. And I'm um, not going to spend tons of time. I asked you to take a look at it to bring questions that you had to class after we review it. Uh, again, you know, as you're reviewing it, uh, again, after I go over some of the uh, parts of it, then um, if you have more questions, uh, I'll be glad to answer them. Um, if you recall, we had originally a quiz that we converted from a traditional mode to Ajax. Um, the, in the traditional mode, we were handling multiple questions, but just sort of as a shortcut for Ajax, we lopped off some of the code to make it only work for one question. Um, and, and that's what we had. And we're going to look at the code here uh, in the original, and we're going to look to see what I changed it to. Um, some of the code actually was still re remained that handled multiple, so we really didn't have to change everything. We just had to change probably the Ajaxy things about it. If you remember, we were, were passing, we we're making this request of the server, our XML HTTP request looks something like that. Grade PHP answer 0 equals 7. All right. We were getting back from the, client, uh, from the server a yes or no, indicating that the question was right or wrong. And then we were, I think, just displaying it on, on the page somewhere. I don't really remember where we displayed it. Let's take a look at the code here. Let me open up the form. All right. Here we have, we're creating the request, grade PHP. We have hard coded answer zero equals, and we have get element by ID answer zero dot value. So we're hard coded for just one question. Our server code, which we cannot see. Sorry, let's go back to this. Yes, we are hard coded for just one question, grade.php, answer zero equals, and we popped in get element by ID, answer zero dot value. Okay, so we were hard coded for just one answer. Our server code then actually would have worked for multiple questions. We just made sure our array only had one answer in it. So it did its thing and returned a Y or an N. And then finally, our client code took that and just put next to the answer uh, in the answer error field, either correct or wrong. And it did it based on whether HTTP response text was equal Y or N. All right. So that's sort of an overview of how we did it originally. Let's look and let's consider what we would have to do to change this. All right. First of all, uh, again, in my mind, we should think about um, really two main things, you know, the, the, the request and the response. What we're going to give to the server and what the server is going to get back from us. Once we decide that, then we can start worrying about writing the code to do it. All right. We saw originally it was, we were giving it just one value on the query string and we were getting back just a Y or an N. Now, um, when we go to multiple questions, we're going to want to give it multiple answers. So we're going to be calling something like this, grade.php, answer 0 equals 5, and answer 1 equals 3, and so on down the line for as many answers as we have. All right. So that's the difference in making the request. Let's, let's overview the things that, that are going on. You know, keep in mind that the client side is responsible for formatting and making the request. The server side is responsible for returning the data, returning the answers, and the client side then is responsible for taking that data and formatting it however we want to. All right? So that's what the client now has to give the server. The server is going to give the client now not a yes or a no, but it will give it two 
responses separated by commas. So if they got the first one right and the second one wrong, you'll get a Y in. If they got both of them right, you'll get a Y, Y, and so on down the line. So let's look at each piece of this um, and compare the one question version with the multi-question version. Of course then the client is going to have a harder job because the client can't simply pop that into a place on the page. The client has to split it out into its components and then plop it on the page. So let's look first of all the process of making the request. Again here is making the request in the original version. HTTP open get grade.php answer zero equals document get element by ID answer value. All right, so very straightforward, hard coded for just one element. <sighs> Gonna be one of them weeks, huh? Grade.php answer zero equals plus document get element by ID. All right, let's look at the multiple one. If you ever get a file that has these funny characters in it, because I edited it on the Mac, open it in WordPad, save it, then you can open it back in Notepad. All right, now our process is a little more, um, a little more extensive. All right. I'm going to form a variable called req that's going to contain my request. And my request is going to start with grade.php. And then we're going to loop through there. Um, every iteration through the loop we're going to add answer i, whatever i is, equals and then the value from the appropriate text box. Now, here's a trick question. This was the one trick part of this assignment. So if you, if you just hard coded a value in for your array subscript, you're, you're forgiven. All right. How do you know how many times to loop? The array's in PHP. The array lives on the server. How is my JavaScript going to know how many times to loop? The JavaScript can't ask how big that array is, right? Because you can, and here's how I did it. I actually made something that you might have studied when you took CISS 216, but like when would I ever use this? I used a hidden form field to hold that. What's a hidden form field? Well, it's just like uh, you'd expect. It's a form field that you can't see. All right. What is the purpose of a hidden form field? Well, if there's some value that the page needs to know that comes from somewhere on the server and you don't necessarily want to make it visible, all right, you can put it in a hidden field. There's other ways to do that as well, but this is probably the most straightforward. And if you look, my hidden field, I give a value of the size of that array, the count of that array. So that, uh, that, that hidden field now has a count of the number of elements. So, up here when I loop, I loop as long as i is less than the value of that hidden field. And that hidden field um, contains the number of elements in the array. So uh, I'm back in business. All right. Each time through the loop, I add to my request string answer followed by an i. So the first time through the loop it's answer 0, the second time it's answer 1, and so on. I add an equal sign. I add then the value of that text box. So I look for get element by ID, answer, you know, the, the, the literal answer plus i. So the first time through it will be answer 0, answer 1, answer 2, and so on. And I grab that value and I add on to the end of my uh, request string. So the first time through, it'll take this request that I had before and add to it 
the words answer zero equals and the value of that answer zero text box. I then, if you notice, and I don't know if it would cause trouble or not, but I'm being neat here. Notice I don't want a semicolon at the end of that. I just want a semicolon between each of them. So I have a little if statement in here that looks and sees if i is less than the value of that q count minus 1, then I'm adding an ampersand to it. Simply put, I'm adding the ampersand to everything but the last entry in the query string. So it'll be answer 0 equals something, ampersand. Answer 1 equals something, ampersand. All the way to the last one, the last time through the loop, I'm not adding the ampersand on the end, and therefore um, there won't be an extra lagging ampersand. Yes? The ampersand between the fields in the in the in the query string, correct? Okay, I wondered what that was. Yep. That's because we don't want an ampersand after literally every field. We don't want one after the last field. One thing I did, by the way, I forgot to mention, is I put uh, the arrays into an include file. By the way, because again, uh, in my original example, I had them in one place, and I clean that up and put them in an include file. All right. Now when we are done, request will have a value of grade.php, question mark, and so on down the line. I then make the request, and I use the contents of the variable req to make the request, and then the rest is the same as before. So in essence, the difference is, is I loop through and format the request to include a variable number of uh, answers as opposed to hard-coded to just one answer. If you wanted to test this before you were done, what I would do is I would do just this. Alert req, right? That will show me the value of req and I can make sure is that the right request that I want to make. So. multi. There's two questions. I'll put in five and six as my answer. Click grade. And I forgot to save it, I'll bet. Why is that not appearing? Oh. I think I'm in the wrong version. I did a second version of this. Let's go in here. There we go. And sure enough, my debug code looks and is producing the request the way I want it to. All right. So that's the difference in the request. There's more stuff to add on the query string. Instead of hard-coded for one, we loop through the array. And the one trick of that is remembering that obscure hidden text field that we can populate via our server-side code so we know. Um, there's probably other ways to do it. We could, for example, given the fact that the only text boxes on this page are answers, we could look and count the number of text boxes on the page, and that would work too. Um, I don't know. Six of one, half does the other. Um, it's good to remember our old friend, the hidden text field. Any of you that have done any .NET programming, by the way, if you look at the source for those pages, you'll see massive hidden form fields, all right, passing stuff around and remembering stuff uh, that they don't necessarily want to make visible anywhere, but, but uh, aids in the client-server communication. All right. Now, the code that is going to format it, if you remember, that code was already pretty much set. 
The only difference is we need to put a comma after each answer. Because the code in the original one, if we look at that grade code, it was already looping, and looping through the array. We just, the array was only one element, so it only did it once. So the only difference we have to do in our multi-example is we now have to put a comma after the Y or an N, each trip through the loop. Well, to be precise, each trip but the last through the loop. Again, we do the same little trick where we have an if statement to see, is this the last time through the loop? If so, or, or if not, add a comma. If it is the last time through the loop, then don't add a comma the last time through. And that's what this does. So that's really the only thing I needed to change about this. All right. And I did change it to include the arrays. Now, as far as processing the results, since we're only getting a single value, a Y or an N, we could just pop that into the inner HTML of answer zero and we're set. Actually, we, we had an if statement that looked at it and popped in either the word correct or the word wrong. In the new version, the multiple version, we have to do a little more. And what we do is we split that response text into an array and then loop through that array. Again, using the hidden field, I guess at this point I could use the length of that array A and that would work as well. Either one would work. But I loop through and each time through I look at that array element sub i and if it's yes I put correct next to that one. If it's wrong I put wrong next to that one. So same thing we just loop through. All right. Now again testing. The one thing I forgot to mention is how could I test the server side code. Again the way I would do it is I would just go and type in the URL of the request that I'm formatting. The answer to both these questions are 6, so if I type in answer 0 equals 6 and answer 1 equals 4, it should say y comma n. And sure enough it says y comma n. All right. Notice how I'm testing at each part. Test to make sure I'm formatting the request right. Testing if the response to the request is right. Then I can go in and test to make sure that the whole ball of wax is right. And if I give that, it shows me correctly if it's right or wrong. All right. Any questions about this? I then gave an extra bonus activity that said that said this for the questions they got wrong display the right answer all right now what would we need to change to do that would we need to change the way the request is made by the client to the server We're still sending it the answers. That has nothing to do with how we're making the request. We're still calling the same script, passing it the same answers. What's different is not the request, but the response. So the code for the request we can leave intact. The PHP code to grade the test um, and return the results to the client, does that need to be changed? Well, yeah, of course. It has to now return not just yes, no, but it needs to return whether they got it correct or not and what, and what the right answer is. All right? So that's, that's uh, a small change, but a change nonetheless. Now, lastly, um, the client, since it's getting back different data than it was before, 
the, the code to process it has to change, right? In other words, we're, now, we're no longer getting just back something like this. We're no longer getting back y and y, y. We're getting back y8 and 7 Oops. and so on. So the, the client code that processes this has a different job to do because it's not just getting back whether I got it right or wrong. It's getting back right or wrong and the answer. Now, one thing I'm going to do with this, all right, is I'm not going to make this strictly a comma delimited um, response. I'm going to use a comma to separate the correctness of the answer, whether it's right or wrong, from the correct answer. And then I'm going to separate by a semicolon for the next pair of correct or incorrect, and right answer. I think it will be obvious when you see the code that processes this why I'm doing that. All right. Um, essentially it's like in the old days where you had a regular tab delimited file. Each record would have a carriage return at the end of it and the fields within a record were separated by tabs. So you'd read until you got the carriage return, that would be one record. You'd split it out by tabs, that would be your individual field. So you do a similar thing here. The bottom line is we need two delimiters, right? We need a delimiter between whether it's right or wrong and the correct answer, and then we need a delimiter between this question's data and the next question's data. So if we look at the code for this, the server side, again, is not terribly earth shattering. All we did is we write if it's yes or no, just like we did before. We put our comma there. We compute the right answer and put it. And then, if it's not the last time through the loop, we throw a semicolon at the end. So, let's look at this. Let's look at So notice what we get. We get the first answer was wrong, so we got a no, and the correct answer is six. Then we have a semicolon that says, okay, here's the data about the next question. Second question was right, so we get a Y, and the correct answer is, is six. All right? So we know that that part is working. We don't really need to retest the, the request because we haven't changed how that works. It's still sending the same request, so we're, we're okay with that. Now we have to go and look at the code that's going to process this. And the code to process this is essentially going to do two splits instead of one. All right. Wow, not a very good job of indenting. Wonder if that's a difference in the text editor I was using. A array, I'm splitting using the semicolon. All right. What does that mean? How many elements are going to be in the A array? However many questions there are. So there'll be an element in the A array for as many questions as there are. All right. So 
A sub 0 is all the data about the first question. A sub 1 is all the data about the second question and so on down the line. I then loop again, all right, and split it again. Each element of A I split again. So I split A sub 0. How many elements are going to be in that B array? Two, right? The, the correct answer, or, or I'm sorry, not the correct answer, but whether they got the answer correct or not, and then the correct answer. So B sub 0 is going to be right or wrong, yes or no. B sub 1 is going to be the correct answer. So I split it. I look to see if B sub 0 is Y. If it is, I put correct. If it's not, I put wrong, and then I output the correct answer, which I know is in B sub 1. One thing to note about this, and um, perhaps I, I don't know if I've mentioned this or not. I probably didn't mention it last time, so now's a great time to mention it. Can someone tell me what's in this response text variable? That HTTP, we know it's the pipeline, right, between the client and the server. What specifically is the response text property? Yeah, it's the answer from the server. It's whatever the server is sending back. So, in the example I had before, it's that Y, semicolon, whatever. In other words, the entire answer that the server sends back is one text field. All right? We therefore have to sort of split that up to get the individual questions and to get the, uh, get the, uh, um, the, the, the correct answer part from, the, from the, whether, they was right or, whether it was right or wrong. All right? So remember, so another way to do this if you're debugging and you want to see what the server is, is responding back with, then just do this. Do an alert of HTTP response text. And you'll see exactly what the server is responding. And it will look like that. I forgot I had that up on the screen. So if I put in 6 and 5, I should expect to see y comma 6, semicolon, n comma 6. And sure enough, that's what we see. So the whole answer comes in the form of that re, uh, response text field. All right, that response text field of that HTTP object contains a complete answer. All right, that the server returns. It's whatever the server is outputting gets put in that variable. And then again, if that represents multiple values, you have to somehow break it apart. Questions on this? One thing, by the way, um, and I think it, it's, it is uh, the machines here are configured to show warning messages where my machine at home that I did this on wasn't. Um, Maybe I did it here, I don't remember. But anyhow, I did it on two different machines. I actually had to remove a line from what I posted to get it to work without an error. It worked, but it displayed an error. It displayed actually a warning message. So uh, if you want to run this out on your own, I mentioned, I think it's line 95, you delete the one little PHP call. Sort of a leftover from what I did before. But um, should be no big deal. Questions about any of this? Now, we had talked before how these things get more complicated. All right? How do they get more complicated? Because the basic recipe is the same. Client side formats and makes a request. All right? That's going to be code that looks like this. All right, here's the, that's essentially what I'm doing here. I'm formatting my request. I know part of it. The rest I'm looping through and I'm adding to the query string and I'm doing all sorts of stuff. But this code, to be honest, really doesn't get much harder than this kind of stuff. Right? 
You might have to grab off of different form elements. You might have to do some calculation. You might have to do a bunch of different things, but in essence, you're doing this. You're making, you're constructing through your JavaScript code a URL that's going to be called. All right? That's what I'm doing here. I'm constructing my URL that's going to get called. You need to set an on ready state change event, and you need to make it so. Send the request. So this code is going to be different from example to example, but it's not going to be terribly harder than this at least in my opinion. Okay. Where does the difficulty come in? The difficulty comes in in terms of the kind of data the server needs to format and send back to the client. All right? And this is where we have the different methods that can be taken for the client to return to the server. In essence, we have three ways the client, three main ways that the client can return data to the server. We have the limited data, we have XML data, right, that's the X in Ajax, and we have something called JSON. which stands for ob uh, uh, JavaScript Object Notation. Now I deliberately drew them that way or wrote them that way because this, there's sort of a continuum here. The limited data is typically the simplest. And by simplest, I don't necessarily mean simplest to program, but it probably is. I mean, it's a very basic structure. With delimited data, what delimited data is good at is the kind of data that we returned in the quiz example. In other words, it doesn't matter if there's one or a hundred questions, right? Our delimited data is going to look like this. And I'm going to draw them as being on different lines even though they're not actually on different lines from the, from the server, but just to make my point maybe a little easier to see. Doesn't matter if we have one question or a hundred questions, this is what we're getting back from the server in the uh, quiz example with multiple questions. We're getting back, and I'll call each one of these a record, that has two fields. And in the old days, they would do it like this, except again, they'd use like a carriage return for that delimiter. Uh, I used a um, semicolon because it's easier to see. All right? So in this case, there's how many records? There's one record per question. How many fields are there? There's two fields per record. All right? Every one of these looks just like in format every other one, right? In other words, record four is of the same structure as record one. If there was a million questions, record million would look the same as record one or record ten or whatever. They all have the so same format. They're homogeneous data. Data of one type. Delimited or sequential files work good with that. All right? So, keep in mind, it's a case of the right tool for the right job, right? It's not a case that XML is intrinsically better than using a delimited file. In fact, if I was doing this quiz, I would only use delimited data for it. I wouldn't bother using XML for this because I have homogeneous data, one type of data. Flat file works perfectly well for that. All right. Um, using XML for this sort of problem would be like the proverbial, you know, smashing a walnut with a sledgehammer. You know, it's overkill. 
Yeah, it will smash the walnut, but that much force is not necessary. So I'm going to change the word hardest here because I don't want to imply difficulty. You know, we don't do things because they're easy or hard. We do them because it's the right solution. I'll call this the most involved. Or maybe a better way to put it is most flexible. Now, another thing about delimited data, another characteristic of delimited data, is it will account for the smallest data transfer. All right. Whenever you're transferring data, um, there's, there's typically associated with the data what you could call overhead. In other words, stuff that isn't data, but it needs to be transmitted so that the data can be interpreted. So for example, this is data. This is data. These two things are overhead. Now, in this particular example, there's just about as much overhead as their data, right? Typically with sequential files, it's not the case. With sequential delimited files, the data might look more like this. Mike, comma, Zellers, comma, M. Zellers at Lorraine C. 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 dot edu carriage return. Paul, Norad, P. Norad, at carriage return. In this case, if, you, if you're counted up, the, the proportion of, of overhead is really small. I mean, there's probably 20, 30 characters of data and three pieces of overhead here. So flat files are very efficient with that. With flat files there's typically a good ratio of data to overhead, which means that it's probably um, the, the easiest to transmit. All right? And that's a consideration if you're transmitting huge volumes of data. All right? So, that's the characteristics of our delimited data. simplest in terms of simplest structure and the smallest data transmitted. Let's write it differently. Delimited data, JSON, XML. Delimited data is good with one type of data. Homogeneous data and involves the smallest overhead, typically. So, if you're trying to decide, I'm doing this AJAX application, what, which of these three methods should I use to transfer the data? Ask yourself, do I have gigantic pieces of data for which Transmitting time would be uh, a consideration. And is the data homogeneous? Is the data only of one type? The answer to those questions are yes. You know, you probably want to go with, um, if the answer to both of them are yes, then you definitely would want to go to that. Um, if, the, if it's one type of data and there isn't a lot of data, you probably still want to go with the limited data. All right? When do you go with JSON then and XML? Typically, the advantage of JSON and XML, there's two sorts of advantages. All right? One advantage is both of these can handle different 
types of data in the same, I'll say file, but what I really mean is in the same chunk of data that you're sending. <coughs> not really a file, you know, it's not really a file that's stored on disk, but in, 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 a, in, a, in a different piece of data. Heterogeneous, I think the spelling is right. So for both of these, if you're doing that, then that becomes possibly a choice. You can do, and here's the interesting thing, you can do, and then I've written applications that have done this, you can use the limited sequential files to handle different records types, but the programming is typically a mess, all right? XML and JSON have built into the data themselves information about how pieces of data are related to each other. All right, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But that means that, in a way, JSON and XML data is self-describing. Whereas with delimited data, typically the program has to know the format of the data. In XML and JSON, the data is tagged, right? Let's imagine for a second if we were doing the quiz with um, what we did with delimited data. Let's think about XML data. With delimited data, we had to know that the first of the pairs of data represented whether the question was right or wrong. And we had to know that the second one was the correct answer. All right. There's nothing in the file that told us that. We just had to know it. Contrast that with XML and JSON where you use tags to identify what the pieces of data mean. So you don't really have to know. The tags will tell you. You don't have to know where it's going to be located in the file. The tags will tell you where it's located. To be sure, you have to understand the tags and all that. But again, it's in, in some way, it's, it's at least to some degree, um, self-describing. XML has the largest overhead. Really, on these two key measures, the simplicity versus complexity, the limited data is simple, low overhead, XML is complex and high overhead, and JSON kind of hit smack dab in the middle. JSON is not as complicated as XML, but more complicated than delimited files. JSON has more overhead than delimited files, but not as much overhead as JSON. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, as XML. So, really there's sort of a continuum here. If we can summarize our findings, delimited data, XML, JSON being in the, main, uh, in the middle, this continuum, continuum talks about complex to simple and also low overhead versus high overhead. All right, so that's in the middle of both. Delimited simple low overhead, XML complicated high overhead. Sort of makes sense, right? The more you're doing, the more you have to pay for it. You know, nothing comes for free, right? So the more complex data that you can store in XML, all right, that sort of implies that there's going to have to be more overhead to express that data in a more complex way. Now, let's back up a minute and talk about XML, all right? And let's talk about... Um, Let's talk a little bit about, about uh, data that would contain uh, multiple data types, for example. All right. Let's say you did a course search 
to search for courses that are offered um, in the spring. All right. And you typed in some criteria and you got a list of courses back. You may get, for example, um, a course, the course name, and the number of credit hours that course is. You might then get, for each course, a list of sections. In other words, if you were to search for CISS 216, you would see that there's a day class for it and an, onla uh, an online section. So you get one class, possibly multiple sections, and then each section is going to have maybe professor data. All right? That the online section is taught by Zellers. This is his office. Here's his phone number. The morning section is also taught by Zellers. And here is his phone number and here is his email address. So when I describe that, there's three different pieces of data, three different kinds of data, not three different pieces of data, three different kinds of data. There's information about the course, there's information about the sections, and there's information about the teacher teaching those sections. Okay. Now, if we try to do that with delimited data, we'd have a mess, right? Because first of all, you don't know how many sections there are. So I couldn't build a simple tab delimited file. I'd have to do something like this. CISS 216, Section 1, Web Development, Three Credit Hours, Meets Online. Instructor is Zellers, and his phone number is 479, oh, 4796. Then I'd have to say CISS 216, Section 2, Web Development 3, meets 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., and a professor is Zellers with 4796 as the extension. And then I'd have the next course, CISS 243, Section 1 web database, four credit hours, meets 5.30 to 7.30, Zellers 4796. If we were writing code to process this, like we were writing code to process the grades, we actually have, we actually want to group these two pieces of data together. Right? How do we know that? Well, we know that because they have the same course number. So that's the same course. Each of these two are its own sections, and then we have the teacher for those sections. Our program has to have the intelligence to say, hey, these two are grouped together. If there were three sections of CISS 243, the program would have to be smart enough to know that these three sections are grouped together. All right? and so on. Again, the intelligence has to be built in to the application. In XML, you don't have that. In XML, our XML data could look something like this. Courses. Course. ID equals CISS 216. Credit hours three. Name is web development. Section number equals one. Time, an online class, faculty, name, 
Zellers, phone 4796. And faculty tag, and section tag, then I could have the next section that had information about the day section and so on. Why is this better than this? Here the code has to be smart enough to match these things together. Here the nesting of the data, all right, the way the data is nested tells you what belongs to what. That, you know, um, this faculty person belongs to this section, this section belongs to this class. Actually, there's a lot of ways that you could do the flat file. This is just one of the ways. But all of them run into the difficulty of the program has to figure out how to like group things together, what belongs to what. All right. Um, actually, I could have made it look uglier if I used a different method to send that flat data over. If I would have sent everything about the course, everything about the first section, everything about the instructor for the first section, everything for the second section, everything about the instructor for the second section. It would look uglier that way. But again, I think you get the idea. In either case, the program would have to do the matching. Here, the structure of the XML data says what belongs with what. All right? And you can think of any time where the data is not just records of, da of, of data that all looks the same, but sort of a structure, a hierarchy, XML is much better at implementing that. Because you can implement, I mean, that's what XML does, is it represents these tree structures, these hierarchies. All right? Now, to be sure, look at the overhead involved here. For every one of these pieces of data, we have a start and end tag. Right? Um, actually, uh, and I, I've, I've heard these numbers confirmed by other case studies, but one uh, experiment we did years ago um, where we converted our delimited files to XML files, the file size increased by like about a factor of 10. So there was like 10 times the volume of data because of the overhead. Because of all the tags and attribute names and so on that you send to get that structure. All right. So again, you see the overhead here is high compared to that with the limited data. But you're able easily to represent a hierarchy where you cannot easily represent a hierarchy with the limited data. Now JSON is somewhere in between. <laughs> All right? XML is the most flexible, most overhead, delimited, handles really one kind of data at a time, you know, data where each record is the same and is low overhead, JSON sort of works partway in between. So over the next couple classes, we'll look at um, an XML version of this quiz and a JSON version of this quiz, and we'll compare and contrast um, to see uh, how they do it. Knowing that the quiz isn't necessarily the best one to show off all the features of XML, but you know, it's better to work on a simple one than to try to do a really complicated one. Yes? Absolutely. You needed to do something more than just spit it out right there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in fact, the one thing I did want to talk about is when I did the quiz, even with multiple questions, I guess I could have just returned how many questions they got right. You know, they had two out of three questions right or something like that. Why instead did I return an individual yes or no for each question? Pardon me? Oh, yeah, so we could know which ones we missed. Let's say that wasn't a requirement. But, yeah. You can always go from more detail to less detail. So in other words, if, if the quiz, I didn't want to show individual questions right or wrong, I just wanted to total them up. If I'm sending the individual question right or wrong, I can tally that up on the client and I can present it. Um, but if I do want to show the individual questions, if I only return the number right, I couldn't do that. Right. So in other words, how do I want to say it? Detailed data you can summarize. 
summarize data, you can't explode into the detail. So even in the limited data, we sort of took the approach of let's return the most flexible data. Let's really return the answers. And let the client then choose how to do this. Imagine, uh, again, if this were uh, an application, a database driven application, there could be parameters that would say how you want the grade to be shown. Maybe I just want to show you got three right and let you figure out which ones you got wrong. All right, maybe that's part of the educational activity. Or maybe I would want to click here for the right answer and then the right answer would pop up. By separating the data that comes from the server from the way the client formats it gives you the most flexibility in formatting it however you want to. And you can vary that, in this case, from quiz to quiz if you wanted to. You could build additional functionality in there. All right. That's all I had. We'll see you over in lab.